Thank, thanks very much. I, I was thinking Diane Abbott and Michael Portillo, a bit, <laughs> maybe. Um, uh, well, welcome to this. Thanks very much for welcoming us. Um, what we thought we'd do is we're talking about uh, two novels. Um, we're talking about Joe's most recent novel, The Adulterance. And he'll explain why it's called that at some stage. And we're talking about Philip's most recent novel, The Friendly Ones, and he'll explain why it's called that at a certain stage. So they already share something in common, which is a kind of, which is what I call puzzle titles. You've got to read the book to find out what the title means. Yeah, Villette, you know, there have been quite a few of them. Um, Paddy Clark, ha, 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 that's a good one. Yeah, but anyway, um, that's a bit of kind of literary trivia for you. Um, what we thought we'd do, as these are both... Uh, uh, newish books is have some brief readings right at the beginning from both books. So um, Joe's going to read first and then I'll ask him a question inspired by his reading, but just one. And then Philip will do the same. And then I will find some extremely ingenious questions which bring both books together. Okay. And of course, there'll be a chance for everybody here. <laughs> To ask questions too. So Joe's going to read first. Great. Did you need to ex well tell us what you're going to read? Uh, I am going to read not right from the beginning, but uh, from page 41 to be precise. And um, the book is narrated by a guy called Ray, who is in his mid 30s. And I think the only thing you need to know about Ray at this stage is that he has a black eye and three stitches in his lip uh, as a result of the. Virtuoso opening chapter, which I'm not going to read to you. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <clears throat> I received a message from our estate agent, Dan. He rarely brought us happiness. <laughs> hey, dude, I'll need your final bid by 5 p.m. today. It's between you and the cash buyers now. If you want a last look, let me know. I'll be there this afternoon. D. Kiss, kiss. <laughs> I got double kisses from our agent. We'd been through so much. <laughs> Garthine and I had agreed that we could not afford to raise our offer, so it was clear we would now lose the horrible ma maisonette and go on renting until death, needing a flatmate, needing Lee to sleep on our sofa to fill our lives with his sad smells and functional <laughs> alcoholism and necessary contribution to the bills. I closed my laptop and went outside into the daylight and the fresher air of Clapton's most congested arterial thoroughfare. Many journalists swear a brisk walk helps them come up with irresistible feature ideas. I walked north thinking absolutely nothing. By the pond, I examined the tall, terraced Georgian houses. Most of them had five or more buzzers for each front door, which was acceptable but a few of them just had a single doorbell, or in the case of number eight, which was a huge detached house with wide gates and a graveled loop of driveway, a lone knocker in the shape of a human hand. Nobody deserved that much space in London. <laughs> I fundamentally hated these people while simultaneously wanting to be them. <laughs> Throughout our 20s, it had been embedded in our worldview that to even talk about property was death itself. The clue was the word mortgage, death pledge in French. <laughs> then we hit our 30s, Garthine got pregnant, and we started going to viewings. Though we tried to maintain a moral superiority, soon we found ourselves wrapping our knuckles against partition walls and saying, without irony, we could knock this through. <laughs> I continued north, watching the houses get smaller, meaner, cheaper. I walked alongside the Lee, one of the country's most polluted and slow-moving rivers, <laughs> full of stringy weeds that stretched out beneath the surface like the hair of drowned children. <laughs> children who had drowned, I decided, because they'd grown up in rented top-floor flats <laughs> with no outside space, faux uncles watching pornography in their play zone during daylight hours, and so they'd ended up down here by the river, depressed, and look, now they were dead. <laughs> I arrived at our former future home, the horrible maisonette, one among many in a joyless four-storey block. 
Though it was unquestionably ugly, it was impossible not to love the private front garden and braced wooden gate. The gate was wholesome. I couldn't help but imagine our child who we loved coming in from school through it. Our child who we loved opening it to receive their charmingly disreputable friends. I sat down on a bench by the river and watched birds circling the wetland centre. They looked like seagulls, but probably that was just my ignorance and they were something more profound. We had never visited the wetland centre, but were working hard at wanting to. <laughs> the front gate, the river, the swans, the marshes, the third biggest park in London. I closed my eyes and thought of everything we were about to lose. After some time, I heard a voice. And I'm sure you two know this is pretty much the last family home at this price point anywhere within the M25. I opened my eyes, heard the sound of a gate clinking gently shut. I waited a moment before turning around. In the residence car park, I saw our estate agent Dan's Volkswagen e-Golf, a car he charges from a three-pin domestic socket. Next to it was a cash guy. I felt something shift inside me and two words bubble to the surface. Cash buyers. It just wasn't fair for a young family like us to have to compete with these people. Though I didn't have my baby yet, I already had my righteousness. <laughs> I stood up, walked to the front gate. The buyers were out of sight, but I could see Dan in short sleeves, leaning against the pale kitchen counter which needed updating. I went around to the back of the block, the loose paving stones clunking behind our former future neighbours' homes, their tropical pot plants and bikes with missing wheels and sad little zones of gravel. I slowed as I reached number five and peered into the empty lounge. The walls were two-tone, navy at the bottom and baby blue above. The thin municipal-looking carpet was speckled with dots, possibly slug pellets, and had a <laughs> scald mark from a clothes iron. During our viewing, I had bent down and touched where the burn had blackened the carpet to hard plastic. We had enjoyed the blemish, Garthine and I had imagined peeling back the carpet to reveal the floorboards beneath. Just the thought of discovering floorboards. <laughs> Bourgeois archaeology. <laughs> and even if it was concrete under there, no problem, we would polish it. <laughs> <laughs> As I looked into the lounge, I saw the hands of the cash buyers on the banisters as they came slowly downstairs. The word banister filled me with an ache I could not name. I had never lived across two floors in London. Newell post, I thought, with longing as they reached the bottom step. They were our age and looked like us. She in a denim dungaree dress and basketball high tops. He in a light pink shirt and deck shoes. The woman made a two-handed signal, something like a breaststroke that seemed to indicate knocking a wall through. <laughs> that made the decision for me. I put up my hood and stepped close to the window, my bruised face at the glass. The sun stretched my shadow goodishly across the room. I raised my right hand and pressed it softly, fingers bent against the glass. That was damn scary. Perhaps I had seen it in films. The woman's stomach entered, entered the lounge and let me be the first to say I did not set out to terrify a woman in her third trimester. <laughs> then came the rest of her. She looked up, saw me, yelled just once but loud, oh, like a tennis umpire, then put one hand to her stomach and the other to the panel of the door. Her husband's head appeared and his eyes widened as they met mine. Given that I was presenting no immediate threat, I was impressed by his willingness to act. His face retreated, and a moment later, I watched the back door handle turn frantically, but it was double locked. Then I saw him run back down the corridor. He was ready to defend his wife, unborn child, and future community. These were the kinds of people you want as neighbours. I turned and sprinted south down the street into Millfields Park towards the wildflower meadow. The topless drunks on the outdoor gymnasium equipment raised their cans as I passed. <laughs> At the basketball courts, I glanced back and saw the man, the father-to-be, following at full pelt. That his shirt stayed tucked in as he ran was intimidating. 
He had a prospective new dad's insane motivation, performance enhancing emotions. I wanted to tell him I empathized completely with his need to perform elaborate heroics. We are brothers, I wanted to say, but he could really run, was conceivably an athlete, and so I had to focus on pumping my arms and legs. I kept going until the homes became unaffordable again. It was a hot day, and my scalp bloomed with sweat. It was reassuring to know that at this speed, the horrible maisonette was not more than nine minutes from the amenities of Lower Clapton. <laughs> I stopped outside the leisure centre where my heavy breathing had an acceptable context. I looked behind me. He was gone. At some point, the man's desire to chase me through the streets had been overcome by the realisation that he had left his pregnant wife alone in an ungentrified neighbourhood, <laughs> a neighbourhood too full of unstable, swollen-faced men like me for them to ever live there. <laughs> I stood on the pavement, the salt of my sweat stinging my wound. This was my city, my pain. I was the winner. We had won. <laughs> Our child would get the happiness. <laughs> Thanks very much. I feel peculiarly vindicated, Joe, by your reading, as I had selected a, an exemplary paragraph of your prose. Oh, which I've already read. Which is one you read yourself. <laughs> so there you are. We're, on, we're singing from the same <laughs> hymn sheet, at least. Um, I, just want, I was just going to ask you, uh, the one question I was going to ask you before Philip does his reading was about, um, about the narrator. Mm. Because uh, we had a little email sort of confab uh, uh, before this event. And you, you described your narrator or you talked about having an unlikable narrator I think and I was just wondering listening to that I mean aren't your no, novelists always say oh the narrator's not me but haven't you given him quite a lot of your sort of thought crimes let's say right not perhaps I mean is is, but, is he you a bit but it, you know this is this this is normal maybe Philip can can expand on this I think it's normal basically channeling and staring into the worst parts of yourself is, I think, part of, at least for me, part of the job and part of what I enjoy. You kind of expand, you think, God, that's a, that's a dark thought or that's a dark part of me. What would happen if that thought became full size as a, as a character? And I, and I think particularly with first-person narrators, you want that blend. Hopefully he's a fun person to spend time with in certain ways and maybe he's quite sweet in, in certain moments, but also he's got loads of uh, fairly reprehensible ways of thinking and behaving. Um, and I think that's normal. I think every, most of us, you're looking at me to say you've never had a bad thought and you're like, I feel, I, I, feel, I feel like most of us have those compromised thoughts. Yes. I hated those people and I wanted to be them. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a thought that you must have had once. Right, right. I think that's from my wife, actually. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, we'll come back to first-person narration in a second. Philip, you're going to read a bit of yours. Yeah, um, yeah my novel... I, I keep losing my headphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, my novel's about uh, two families who uh, live next door to each other, and um, one of the um, one of the centres of the uh, of one of the uh, the families is the two uh, youngest children, brother and sister, who um, are very closely bonded, but more more perhaps in one direction than another. And I'm going to, just going to read a little bit from. Uh, um, their, uh, their youth. They'd always loved settling in the car and driving off together, Hugh driving Lavinia. She had been the curious failure. Blossom had learned to drive and Leo had learned to drive, but Lavinia's 17th birthday had come and gone and she had made a brushing off gesture if anyone mentioned it. She had not learned to drive. She had got into Oxford and, unlike Leo, had stayed in Oxford. She had stayed in Oxford because of Leo, but afterwards she had wondered what the hell his problem had been. It was true that... <laughs> yeah. Tolstoy never had this, did he? <laughs> no. Yeah. Great. OK. <laughs> I hope I can get that off again. Um, she had stayed in Oxford because of Leo, but afterwards she had wondered what the hell his problem had been. It was true that it was her first experience of education where people didn't hit her because she was called Lavinia or just say, is there a lav in here? 
<laughs> but it had seemed okay to her. It was her second summer back that Hugh had had his 17th birthday back around Easter and had spent the next four weeks learning to drive with an intensity of concentration that surprised even his mother, or so she told Lavinia. And then when she had come home at the beginning of the summer, he had been... She made allowances for the imaginative power of memory here. He had been standing outside the beautiful big house, leaning with one elbow on the roof of a car. Had it been blue or yellow or black? What colour were cars? <laughs> Dark blue, she thought. Anyway, he was leaning with one elbow on the roof of the car and a huge, brilliant, naughty smile. In his hand was a set of rattling keys, like an insistent and exotic percussion instrument that would make itself heard through a large orchestra. He shook them. Behind him in the porch was Daddy, the jovial presence, his arms round Mummy and Blossom and Leo, proud of their little brother. That couldn't have been the, the case, since both Blossom and Leo were certainly married and living lives away from Sheffield by the time Hugh was 17. But that was what she remembered. They were giving their blessing to Hugh in his car and his ear-wide shining smile, full of illicit possibilities. He was a nice-looking boy, her brother. That talk about him come, becoming an actor, it might not be all rubbish. She had put her suitcase into the boot of the car without a, even really greeting Mummy and Daddy and the big ones, and off they had driven. The whole summer. It was the summer Charles and Diana had got married, the summer after Granny Spinster had died. That was how they could drive wherever they wanted. They'd got £3,000 each from Granny Spinster. They went to the ordinary local places to Chatsworth and Bakewell, as if they were old folk enjoying a nice day out. Then they had daringly got onto a motorway, and Hugh screaming with terror, gripping the steering wheel, they had driven all the way to Leeds, had a cup of tea, and come straight back again. Was it then that he'd said, you can just drive anywhere? And that summer, they'd got into the car and driven down, out of Sheffield, down eastwards and downwards, until they'd seen a sign to Harwich. Granny Spinster's £3,000. It wasn't until they had almost reached the ferry terminal that Hugh admitted he'd translated £1,000 of Granny Spinster's money into travellers' cheques, thinking he might as well do this sometime soon. Where were they? There in the bag, along with Hugh's passport and Lavinia's passport. He put them both in when they set off. They'd driven through towns bright with bunting. There on the board, there'd been Espierg. Where was Espierg? It had a polar bear feel. They'd bought the tickets. Forever afterwards... Lavinia had loved getting into a car with her little brother Hugh and being driven him, driven by him. Forever afterwards, she was sitting in the passenger seat, eating some bizarre salted licorice, wearing clothes that they'd had to buy in a Danish service station, not having packed, driving across the flat, windy grasslands towards the birthplace of the composer Nielsen, a composer they had never heard of, whose collected symphonic works they invented and sang in two-part counterpoints, shrill and rumbling, hardly wondering whether there was any money left. Granny Spinster's £3,000. It must have been on that trip that Lavinia had said to Hugh, ''Don't you hate meeting new people?'' Why should I? he said. You mean if they look at us and laugh because we're tiny? No, of course not. If anyone did that, they wouldn't be at all the sort of people I'd want to meet. She'd always remembered that afterwards, tried to live by it, not to be frightened at the idea of meeting anyone new. When there was a hundred pounds left, they said goodbye to Denmark and went regretfully homewards. They just made it. The petrol sputtering out as they turned into the Sheffield Road they and the ancients had always called home. What sort of car had that been? Lavinia had no idea. It had cost Hugh another 500 of Granny Spinster's money. Maybe it had been blue. <laughs> okay, I've, I've actually, I'm, I've got two questions okay. about, about uh, inspired by that reading. One's a, a, a a tiny one, and yeah. one's a more important one. The tiny one is, why do you make... The, the family were all very small. Yes. And, the, and that keeps coming up. Why, why, did you, why did you do that? I don't know. No. They I just thought you might not. No, I, I, well, I do... Well, they didn't come round that, that way round. Yes. Um, I couldn't quite work out why they behaved in this particular way. And I wrote quite a lot of the, the novel, and it was kind of puzzling to me, the, uh, the thing that had determined their, their shared character. And I was about 200 pages into the novel, and I suddenly thought, of course, they're all, they're all between 4 foot 10 and 5 foot 1. And then it made perfect sense, you know. And they, they, that, was what, that was what they were like. Yes. They didn't that is quite small. 
<laughs> that is quite small. Yeah, it is quite small. Yeah. yeah, it was like it's like a story about um, about Evelyn Moore when he was writing um, um, when he was writing Put Out More Flags. There was a character whose behaviour totally puzzled him. He couldn't understand. This woman kept coming in and talking in a very measured way, and then leaving without saying goodbye, having insulted people. And he could not understand this character. And the story goes that he was one day sitting at dinner with, uh, with Lady Diana Cooper, and just said out of the blue, I know, she's drinking in secret. And that was the explanation for it. And it was very much like that with, the, these, with this lot. I, I couldn't understand why they were like that. And then I saw that they were uh, short, and then that explained the, the <laughs> whole thing. <laughs> OK, so it's not a small question. And, and, <laughs> and uh, the, the other one was that it, you used a, a, a phrase, a clause, when you were talking, yeah. which, which uh, reminded me of the the thing I was often wondering why, while I was reading the novel, when you said, um, so Hugh and Lavinia discover they can actually go anywhere. You've got a car, at least at this, you know, in those days you could just go anywhere. And um, choosing, because there are two families, as, as, as Philip says in this novel, and they're quite a lot of members of the families. Mm. And they're also friends and associates and partners and lovers and husbands and wives and bear children and so there are quite a lot of people yeah. and uh, you adopt the viewpoints at different times of quite not everybody but but of quite a few of the characters and um, and it struck me that 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 phrase that you use is also sort of true of of the novel that you could go anywhere in a way yeah. and I wondered how you just whether you had a kind of mm great big sort of map or something or whether it was instinctual or whether you had some sort of um, how it was you decided where to go, who to go with really at well, any given point. I think there's a general view, I think there's a general viewpoint that is, that is interesting when you're, when you're writing a novel I think it's very rarely the most important significant person. Often it's the person sitting slightly off to one side who's watching everything that goes on. Um, and so it was that sort of, sort of person, the person that isn't quite included, isn't quite driving things forward, but is watching the stuff um, going forward. And uh, I think because the novel is about, um, about you know, different, um, about the validity of different experiences, um, I think it would have felt very strange to have had a single, uh, single viewpoint carrying on for, for, for very long. I, I think I wanted to know what it was like inside the head of uh, uh, most of um, most of these people. Um, there is a <laughs> there's even a, there is a, even a, a paragraph uh, where uh, the the tortoise who's called Gertrude. <laughs> Has a little, uh, has a little glimpse of the, the action so far. I enjoyed, uh, yeah. I enjoyed writing uh, a paragraph from Gertrude's point of view, but I thought that it's actually a novel narrated by Gertrude. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, in Anna Karenina, there's a bit where you see it from the dog's point of yeah. view for a paragraph, just yeah. one glorious paragraph. It's yeah. from the dog's point of view. Yes. So absolutely. you know, the novelist is allowed to get into any head that he or she likes. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I do, I do find um, I, could, I do admire the um, single the single viewpoint um, novel, and I, I'm, at the moment I'm writing a novel in the first person, so it's it's quite kind of rigidly down the thing. But it is um, it is challenging. Yeah, I find it I find it hard, and I think actually it's quite hard to write a novel of more than a certain length with a single single viewpoint. Well, what, what, I mean, that's a good segue, a gracious segue to, to, to what Joe does, because, well, tell me if this is wrong. I mean, your narrator, everybody's heard a bit of what, it, what Ray sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on Ray, is a, it, it's not a usual, you know, everybody knows, first-person narrator might be, might be limited, unreliable, you might not believe everything they say, they don't, you know, they see things only from their point of view, all that stuff, but... Ray's got a peculiar characteristic, it seems to me, which I really enjoy, which is that he sort of can't not be ironical, really. Mm. Yes, he just can't. And mm. actually, it gets him into quite a lot of trouble mm. in the end. 
um, doesn't it? He cannot register something as being, um, you know, just genuinely anxiety causing, upsetting, unpleasant, or even happy, actually, without turning it into an ironical comment. Right. And that's his, that's his fatal flaw, basically. And, and the novel, the kind of, one of the ideas for the novel was what happens when a novel is full of jokes and ironic witticisms, and initially the person's life is kind of well matched with that jolly tone, and slowly descends, you know, like, can, well, he can, but what does it feel like to be unable to not find things funny when your life has completely been destroyed? So, the, so the, his kind of downward trajectory in all real terms is, is, is permanently and hopefully um, kind of distressingly matched by him still having the same <laughs> surface voice. So he's kind of, he's trapped in it, and I hope the jokes start to feel more desperate and sadder. Yes. So, and even, you know, the, to some extent, perhaps, I, perhaps this is contentious, but to some extent, I'm trying not to give it, because it, it is a novel with a plot, so I will try not, not to use any spoilers. Thank you. Um, but when he gets into difficulties with the police, <laughs> that thing makes it worse. It's not just he's mm. not, makes him not face up to it. It actually has an effect. Mm. When he gets into difficulties with his marriage, arguably, the fact he says, when I think of a decent joke, I just have to make it. Yeah, he says that quite early on. And, yep. and that actually is sort of has a, a real effect on his fate, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess he's, he's, ex he's thinking of himself as a, which he is, a privileged white middle-class person who's never going to have to face dealing with real life. And then fate or his behaviour puts him in these situations, the police and various other things, where suddenly he's only got one way of speaking. He's basically got the way he speaks to his friends. He doesn't have yeah. a, another mode. And it causes problems. And I wanted to... Uh, I mean, I, that, that brings me to something which I then, then links to what... I think Philip's doing in his novel, which is that one thing the two novels do have in common, so one's short, <laughs> one's long, one's in the first person, one's in the third person, one's limited point of view, one's multiple point of view, one stays in a very limited time, one ranges across decades. So I've got a challenge here um, in making these, but they're both kind of social novels, maybe sort of slightly Condition of England novels actually, but certainly they're both social novels and I wanted to ask you both about that and what you've just said about Ray, kind of all his friends are like that too, they all um, uh, you know, even if somebody is absolutely furious because their wife is having an affair with somebody, they turn it all into something very sardonic and joking, everybody's like that it's like there's a whole social group of 30-something people in semi-creative but not very creative jobs, I don't know, doing sort of advertising or something, <laughs> and some of them have got kids, but they're kids really, aren't they, these adults? Yeah, it's a, it's a coming-of-age novel about people in their 30s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all addicted to making jokes. Yeah, it's a, it, it is actually a process, a form of processing for them. The, the final scene isn't a spoiler to say the final scene is about them talking about what's happened to them and they kind of tell each other's stories back to them. Like, you tell me what's happened to you as if, as if you're me. And they kind of perform each other's trauma by that point. A lot of bad things have happened. Um, and so it, it, it's a form of getting through um, traumatic things for this group of people to turn it into something fun. And, and your novel, Phillips, mm. is social, it's a historical novel as well because a large part of it goes back to 1971 and goes to what is now Bangladesh for yes. the kind of prehistory of one of these two Sheffield families. And you do, in a way, the simplest way, which is you make them live next to each other. The sort yes. of, yeah. yeah, I mean, they had to... Uh, they had to get in touch with each other somehow. <laughs> um, I think actually the 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 point about the um, the moment of um, uh, of Bangladesh, which which is um, connected to to Joe's novel, is that I think the um, for for once 
I found myself um, writing about people who meant exactly what they were saying. You know, the, and it was hard actually. There's a there's a scene in the novel where one of the the boys comes back from the rally where the the about to be leader of the independent Bangladesh has made a, a speech. It's a famous historical moment in Bangladesh, and he's telling his family what has happened with utter fervour. And as a novelist, it was incredibly hard to write that scene because, you know, the whole... I think, actually, as a novelist, I'm, I think we're all kind of addicted to layers of, of ambiguity and flirtation and, and actually to, to come across somebody who was just saying, this has happened, this is what is going to happen, this is something I believe in with all my heart. It was, uh, it was a tricky one, actually. Fortunately, it only happened that once. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but also it becomes, yeah. I guess, you know... George Eliot style, <laughs> it, when yeah, you start doing exactly. these novels of, 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 of families and of social groups, and you are, yeah. in a sense, you are, an, an, you are a novelist who's decided yeah. you can move between people, yeah. it necessarily also becomes a novel about the yeah. things that the pe group, people don't know about each other. Yes. So I was very yeah. conscious that the section, the 1971 yeah. section, when we, we, yes. we go to to um, um, East Pakistan, as it was then, yeah. um, is all something that the sort of well-heeled doctor's family yes. who live next door to these people yeah. will never know. They'll, They'll never just know never know. It. Yeah, I mean, that was, um, that was something that, that does, does strike me, that I think that we, um, in this country, we do have a very good record of getting on with new, new arrivals, but it does seem to me that quite often it's at the... It's at the cost of not really knowing what these people who are suddenly our new best friends have actually gone through. And so the, the structure of the, the novel was really de designed around that. The first half is just the, the two families living next door to each other and a family crisis in 1990. And then something rather odd happens. And then you go back to 1971 and you just see what this family has been through. And they have a, a, one, of their, one of their brothers was uh, uh, murdered by the Pakistani uh, occupying forces. And still at the end of the novel, the, the two families are very much bound together. But there's quite a limit to how much uh, Sharif and Nazia, the, uh, the Bengali couple, feel that they can really share with, uh, share with people. And I think, um, I, I, do think um, I, I do think that, actually. Um, I think that, um, you know, we don't, we, we're, sort of, we're sort of shy in this country of actually asking the direct question. And there's a, there's a, there's a kind of liberal English terror of saying to people, um, uh, where, um, you know, where are you from? Because, of course, people will say, well, I was born in Hackney, you know. <laughs> or, you know. But, um, but I think it's perfectly OK to say to people, surely, where was your family originally from? But we don't ask that because we're so terrified of, um, uh, of, uh, of causing offence. And the, uh, the result is we don't hear these stories. One decision that I made about the, the novel was that um, uh, probably most of the, the walk-on parts, the people who just kind of appear referred to as somebody's boss, they have a, a Nigerian name or, a, or an originally Chinese name. It's just, um, there's just this kind of little flickering texture of, um, of people from, um, from immigrant, um, immigrant families um, in the, the, the few generations. And just, I just wanted to see if people noticed that, actually. And I think most readers haven't noticed no. it. No. <laughs> and, Which and proves my point. Uh, yes, yes. So, yeah, it's difficult to know whether that's a good thing they don't notice or a bad thing they don't notice. I th yes, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. yeah. And, and you do, I mean, I was saying they're both social, social novels. Um, they both, we'll come to the titles in a second, but they also, both novels, take a, to me, relatively recent and relatively um, traumatic public event in the history of this country and use that as quite an important part of their plot. And in, um, and in, in your case, it's the 7-7 bombings and 
how much am I allowed to give away? You're allowed to give it away. Okay, yeah. well, I'll just say one of the characters. Yeah. One of the characters, and there are a lot, so it hardly gives away anything to <laughs> say. But one of the main characters is killed yeah. in the 77 bombings. And, um, and Joe, your novel um, is involved in, and Ray's involved in, the 2011, was 2011, yeah, yeah. riots. So... Um, and of course, for a reader like me, 1971 genocide is Pakistan. I'm finding out stuff. Mm. But for, re- for me, I guess for quite a few readers, a 7 7 bombing is, is a jolt. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I can go on Wikipedia and it lists the names of all the people who were killed in it, and yes. it's not one of your no, characters. No, no, and no, so, I, I mean, yeah. that decision. Tell us yeah. a bit about that decision and why well, that was an important decision in the book well it just um, it, it just kind of came into the into the book really and the book is really um, about the um, the confrontations of different um, different cultures um, in in complicated and unreconciled ways and the the seven seven bombings I think what set it off was I was halfway through the the book, and I was teaching a creative writing course, and in um, at the Arvon Foundation, and a woman came on the course who was writing, who was a survivor of Seven Seven, and she was writing a, um, she was writing about her experience. And I wasn't going to take any of her experiences, and I, I didn't, but she did say one thing in conversation, which. Um, which absolutely grabbed me, which was at meetings of 7-7 seven, seven survivors, I don't know if anyone knows this, that an etiquette has emerged that if there are bereaved people in the room, then the survivors won't describe in detail how they escaped in front of them. And that for me was, uh, this, uh, was almost something that was more human than, um, than any of them. And then on top of that, because I'm... Um, um, because I'm, uh, I'm married to a, a, a Bangladeshi, and um, he, not not him, but uh, some some of his his friends. I was very struck after seven seven, the way they talked about the the bombers, and how a certain amount of ancient bitterness towards Pakistanis crept into the way they were still talking about about those bombers, and I thought. We have to kind of talk about that in a kind of unresolved sort of way. So it was such a kind of complicated little knot of of attitudes that was just kind of laid bare by this kind of savage and atrocious um, event. Of course, I couldn't I couldn't have put a, a real name into, no, no, into it. So, and and what about your decision to use? Or to, to embroil mm. your narrator in the riots disastrously for him. Yeah, the the riots for these characters, it's partly about how they fail to see the, the, the riots could be possible. It's partly about their complete inability to, at first, at least notice the riots. They're so insular, um, and then it's about. I guess this is the first person novel. It's very much about a man with a blinkered perspective leading his life in London without really looking beyond himself and the riots I guess are a moment where suddenly all the other narratives other people's lives that surround him in London come to the surface and he's and he's suddenly faced with all sorts of interactions he would never uh, ordinarily uh, have and it's one of those interactions that is the kind of uh, spur for his life really heading downward but it's all isn't it also um in the logic of the novel, I, it was almost as if um, the riots aren't so surprising. I mean, in the reading, I noticed that you, that you did. Um, you know, uh, one man chases another down the street, um, and the narrator says, "You know, oh my, you know, he's obviously he he jokes about it in his head to us. Oh, he must have turned around because he suddenly realises he's left his wife in a bit of London, which is full of." You know, red in the face, people like men like me. Um, there's lots of jokes about the threateningness. Mm. You know, children drowned in the River Lee. Mm. You know, sinister uncles. There's lots of jokes about um, the drunks in the street, about 
the well, supposed threateningness of right. the urban environment, and then. But there's that's the fetish fetishization of of supposedly or or actually threatening neighbourhoods. You know, people move to a neighbourhood, or at least people in my generation move to a neighbourhood deliberately because it is edgy or it has a high crime rate. You know, the house pricing is lower, but also that's just more exciting. So people have an idea that that's somehow cool. And what happens when that coolness is actually manifested in genuine violence? And, yes. um, yeah. You're right. It's a peculiar thing, isn't it? My son's favourite character in the bit of London I live in is this guy he calls Hat Man. And my son's quite a kind person, I think. And he doesn't call, say it in a derisive way. And there's this man who walks around talking to himself all the time and wheeling a strange sort of tripod on wood on a single bicycle wheel and talking angrily to himself. And if you listen to what he says, it's quite well-informed stuff about politics and things. But he's very, very angry. And he's obviously a kind of, everybody knows who he is. And he never strays outside the borough of Camden. So you'll see it by Euston Station or by, you know, right up in Hampstead. But you would never, so he'd never cross over somehow. And, but, I, I mean, I was kind of reminded of him because your novel is full of that sort of sense of the kind of, the comedy of potential threat, but then it becomes, and even when they're rioting, he gets, your narrator gets involved in it as a sort of almost a joke, doesn't he? Yeah, I guess that's the tipping point when being involved in something as a joke can no longer be a joke, even whatever he, <laughs> feelings he had about it at the time, from that point on, it's serious. Yeah, there's a great bit, I'm sorry, I'm gonna give this away, there's a wonderful bit where he sees a poster so, you know, one of those posters put up, have you seen this man? Report him. And he's sort of looking at the poster and saying, oh, he wears the same shirt as me. What a strawberry <laughs> coat. <laughs> well, you, you can imagine how it ends. Um, we've almost got to question time, but I, wonder, I, I did say that one mm. perhaps not superficial thing the novels share is uh, a teasing, let's say, title. So I wanted, I wanted just to... Ex if you might explain that, Philip. Why is yours called the friendly ones? Well, on uh, on one level, it's um, it's a very um, it's a very ordinary um, it's a very ordinary thing that when you move into a new um, a new street or take up a new job, you have in your your mind um, after a bit, you know, the ones at number thirty two, they're they're some of the friendly ones, you know, they're, they're okay. You know, the ones <laughs> next door, maybe mm, not so much, you know. And, um, you know, there's a sort of divide here about who's going to reach out to you, which is very important for Sharif and Nazia when they're coming into this, um, this country. The other, um, the other thing, um, it's, a, it's a bit of it's the story of the, uh, of the Bangladesh War of Independence. And... There's a there's a real there was a real organisation in uh, in 1971 of uh, of collaborators, um, Bengali collaborators who um, sci who handed over relations and um, and neighbours to the Pakistani authorities who were then kind of uh, tortured to death. And in real life, the organisation was called the Peace Committee, and I. Thought, I, I did think at one point I was going to call the book The Peace Committee, but uh, my husband put his foot down <laughs> and said, there's no way that you could call a book The Peace Committee because it's such a fraught and unhappy name in, uh, in Bangladesh. No, uh, no Bengali reader would ever want to pick a book up called that. So, um, so I thought I'm going to keep the organisation, but I'm going to give it my own title. And I called the organisation The Friendly Ones, which seems to me pretty well what those organisations do. They have a kind of hideous euphemistic, um, <laughs> euphemistic title. But uh, incidentally, the, uh, the collaborators are the only people um, who, uh, who are responsible for people's deaths in the war that have ever faced justice. No, um, no Pakistani uh, genocide has ever been prosecuted for the hundreds of thousands of people they killed during the war. So the adulterants, yeah. Um, well, an adulterant, as, I'm, as you all know, is a toxin, a uh, kind of poison, that is, as you can probably also guess, a pun on another word. Um, but the idea was, in lots of ways, the book is about small, how small things can poison the whole, like how can a certain group of people uh, affect a city negatively, how, what small 
thing, perhaps an inability to be sincere. How can that poison the marriage? Um, how can money spoil a friendship group? So, I, I, and there's a sense of like kind of toxins in the air. There's lots of stuff about. There's a kind of running riff about raise awareness of other people's bodily functions <laughs> and you know bacteria and all this sort of stuff. So um, that's, I guess, the literal adulterance. And then there's obviously puns on adultery and adult. It's, it sounds to me like adult-ish, um, which is kind of, what, <laughs> kind of what they are. OK. Um, we've got a mic. Have we got a mic? We've got a mic, yes. Would anybody here like to ask a question? <laughs> I have a quiver full more of my own, but you might save, save our writers from them. Yes, lady here. Hi, I just wanted to ask Joe a very short question. Ha you said that this novel is very much about people in their 30s, and you mm. said lots of very interesting things. How much is this novel about London? It's, it, it's very, I think it's very specifically about London in that there's this monster, a useful monster for a fiction writer, and that's the housing market, and, and it's... You know, I'm, I'm always looking for ways in which my characters' lives can be <laughs> destroyed, and, and that seems like a very, <laughs> like a very useful one. Um, so yeah, it, it couldn't really, certainly in the time that it's set in 2011, it, there was nowhere else in the UK where those stories were uh, happening. So yeah, it's, it's particularly a London book. And, and I was conscious, I've lived here now for 10 or so years, and I was conscious that I really wanted to write a London novel, but I didn't know how. I thought of London novels as capacious and all-encompassing and telling all the stories. And I slowly realised that if I was going to write a London novel, it would have to be about, I think, that feeling you have in London where you're on one track and you know there are hundreds of other tracks and you almost <coughs> never see them. You live in the same city, but you're on two different planes. And um, so I wanted to try and tell a kind of really narrow <laughs> take on London as a way to speak about the whole place. And, and Philip, you've mm. written a novel, novels before about Sheffield. Yeah. I mean, that's a... I was brought up in Sheffield. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but um, it's a different thing, isn't it, if you use that city, because yeah. I think it's famously the city that... the large city in Britain that people are least likely to have been to, I think. There was yeah. a sort of... Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Hull, Hull beats it, but Sheffield... Sheffield, yeah. it's a bit smaller. Sheffield, Hull. no, Sheffield's bigger. Yeah, no, Sheffield's Hull is bigger, a bit yeah. smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. but um, and yes. so you must be conscious that when you're using Sheffield as you do, yeah. and it's full of place names and locations yeah. and and kind of sociological data in a way or topographical mm. yeah. data, it's you're writing, you know, what would once have been called a provincial novel. You're writing a novel that mm. about a place which is specific that people don't expect to recognise. Yeah. But well, it depends where you are, really, yeah. isn't it? I mean, in Sheffield, they know where it is. You know? So, um, I mean, Sheffield, they're always a bit shocked that, uh, that there's, uh, there's, that it's so identifiable when I write about. I think it's, uh, it's, I find it very appealing to write about somewhere that um, um, no one else has, uh, has really written a novel about. Um, and I, I would find it very difficult to write a novel about Venice, because you know Henry James is kind of over your shoulder. But uh, um, yeah, I think everything's I think everything's provincial, really. I mean, the, as you get closer and closer to the centre of things, it still seems more and more marginalised. And I say this somebody who used to work in the um, in the House of Commons, and often the House of Commons seemed like a like something on the edges of things, and the, there was the government, and where, where was the government? Was and as you got closer and closer to the centre, it still felt as though you were on the outside looking in. So I, I don't know. I think Sheffield's a very kind of um, central, important place, but uh, I don't know. It's, it depends where you're standing. I know. Yes, lady here, and then at the at the back. I am four foot ten and fifteen sixteen. <laughs> 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 well, there is smallism, 
around. Oh, <laughs> Somebody so once asked me if I was technically a dwarf. I was just wondering. Oh, no. <laughs> I was just wondering yes. a little more about why you'd focus on small people. Well, because we are lovely. Yes. Well, some of them are and some of them aren't. Mm. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you in the tent afterwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, um, I, well, it's not, uh, um, I mean, I, I say this as somebody who's probably taller than average, than six foot two, and it's something that I, I do wonder about. How has the, how's the fact that when I'm in a crowd, I can, al- I can always see over the top of people's heads, mm. how has that affected my personality? Um, and... I don't. I don't know. I could. I don't think I can really put it into into words. Um, f- more than I, I mean, I wrote the novel to to explore the the possibilities of being a family of um, of conspicuously shorter than <laughs> usual people, and I hope that I haven't done it in a <laughs> cliched way. Um, uh, some of my best friends are short. <laughs> I just wondered if they bang their bottoms on the curb. But sorry, I just wondered if they bang their bottoms on the curb. But you know, no, <laughs> no, no. There aren't there aren't scenes where they kind of cry in supermarkets because they can't. No, no, okay. no, no. This is, no, it, they're, they're treated with uh, with respect, <laughs> apart from one. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, but no. I think actually, it. I I did slightly steal it from a. Um, from a fascinating story by Isaac Barbell, wh- which is about three men getting slowly drunk in, uh, in Tsarist Russia. And the very last line of the story is that um, all three of them are extremely short. Um, and you have to go back and read the story again and start, and it's, it's like a different mind's eye sort of thing. And it's not the first thing you hear about these these people, their height. You you get to know them, you see them, you see their lives, and then somebody observes that it's kind of uh, this this fact about them, and then it's kind of like an interesting um, extra extra fact about them. It's a sort of playful thing. No, it is a different so. perspective on the world. Yeah. Yes. Especially absolutely. on the tube. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we had a, I think there was a questioner at the back. Somebody had their hand up. No, yes. Where's the, do you want the mic? Yes, thank you. Reluctantly. If you, if you watch the last episode of The Bridge, the crucial thing is the photos have been taken from a certain angle. I won't, sh- no, no, okay, sorry, sorry. Play again, no, sorry, oh. sorry. I, I just really wanted to say, and then I've got to wrap up, that um, I don't agree with you about Sheffield, <laughs> and um, I really enjoyed the Northern Hemency. You, you don't there. agree with me about no, Sheffield? No, I don't agree with what you said. Yeah. What, what, what were you not agreeing no, with? No, I think, I think Sheffield is a great backdrop for yeah. novels. I don't think I was saying... No, OK. I wasn't saying it was a bad one. <laughs> and, and there are lots of novelists who set their novels in Sheffield... Um, yourself and um, the two caravans, etc. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's yeah. what I would just say. I think the I think I'm quite um, I'm quite drawn to these um, to these places that are surprisingly bigger than people imagine. Like Sheffield, is it the fourth biggest city in England? Yeah. No one ever believes that, but it, it's <laughs> true. Um, Sim- similarly, um, my husband's uh, is, uh, is first language is Bengali, and Bengali is the sixth most widely spoken language in the world. Um, it's uh, astonishing. One of these days, I'm going to write a novel set in Kazakhstan, which is the ninth largest country in the world. Anyway, <laughs> but, um, anyway but it, it, those are interesting, those <laughs> facts that are kind of huge and, and seen. Everybody ought to know them, but somehow the eye has slid over them until... Um, until a novelist decides to write, uh, write a book about them. Oh, yes, we've got time. <laughs> if it's a quick one. Yeah, I just wondered how you think these novels will be viewed in, say, 20 or 50 years' time in terms of people looking at them, in terms of who knows what's going to happen with London 
in the world, yeah? But I just wondered how you, whether you wrote them for today or whether you wrote them for the future in terms of London and Sheffield, in terms of most um, geopolitical <laughs> well, political analysis. Well, naturally, I hope that there's going to be a golden altar in the <laughs> <laughs> square where people are going, oh. um, I think all you can... I, I, you, who knows? Who knows whether anyone will read novels in, in 50 years' time or whether we'll all be staring at screens and uh, pictures of Kim Kardashian, I don't know. Um, I mean, all you can do, really, is to try and write something kind of truthful and well-made. And I have to say that I, th I do think, think Joe's novel is a supremely well-made object. No, and, just, um, and just see if it lasts. You never know what will, what will last. I think the one thing that you can say is that um, books that are conspicuously about... Um, significant, important subjects, but not necessarily very well put together, don't last. Um, <laughs> it's always um, a beautifully made object that uh, that has a tendency to hang around. But who knows? Who knows? Joe, do you think about what Swift called Prince Posterity? <laughs> oh, actually, I, I think you mentioned this last time I saw you, that you tend to set your novels pre-mobile phones. Yeah. Right. Um, and I thought... That's an interesting question because you think, can I mention Twitter? Like, if I if I mention Twitter in my novel, have I instantly uh, do, doomed it? And, and actually, I think that is a decision. In the end, I I kind of went, I just really ran with that. I thought if I'm going to do it, then it has to be totally specifically this yeah. moment and honest about that moment. And and I'm not going to second guess its its life in the <laughs> in the centuries to come. But I I certainly didn't want to try and second guess what is a valid thing to talk about in, in what's going to seem important in the future. So I just tried to tie it uh, very, very honestly to now. OK, well, uh, 50 years, I won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> but you possibly might be. <laughs> Philip, the jury's out. Um, and I'm sure you would all want me to thank Philip and Joe for discussing their books. They will be in the talent the talent area where signings take place, which is the bandstand the afterwards, if any of you like a, uh, a book uh, signed, and I'm sure you'd want to thank them with me.